Welcome to part three of our tour of the Aroostook Historical and Art Museum. What we have here is a wood stove or coal stove, depending on the grate that was put into it, that was made right here at the Houghton Foundry. The Houghton Foundry was at the intersection of Military and Bangor Street. Later it would be Putnam Brothers Triangle Golf, the Tower Restaurant, uh, and today it's the home of the Sitco Station. As we come into this room, we see a lot of items that are primarily women's articles. On the right, we see a number of pictures of the fashionable young ladies of Holton. As we look around the room, we see a number of items of clothing, uh, of footwear, almost entirely ladies with one exception. We do have a men's wedding vest that reportedly was worn by a Mr. Levitt from Monticello when he got married in 1860. Like so many items, there's a story and it doesn't quite jive. Uh, this particular vest has pictures of six different pretty young ladies uh, on each of the six buttons on the vest. That technology actually didn't come into use until sometime after the Civil War. So we know that this vest uh, dates a little later, or at least the buttons do. But still a great story. If it's a wedding vest with six pretty young ladies on it, uh, you wonder how the groom survived <laughs> that particular faux pas. Collars were all the rage uh, in the Victorian era, and of course you had to have a little bag to put all your little collars into. Over to the far right we have a really interesting piece. Uh, it's hair jewelry and hair art. It was extremely common in the period before the Civil War to take some of your deceased relative's hair and weave it into pieces of jewelry or in this case into a wreath that's kind of like a horseshoe and of course for good luck it is open to the top, open up to the heavens. You, you would never hang a horseshoe or an item such as this upside down or you'd be really, really taking your chances. We have a lot of women's clothing on mannequins throughout the museum. Uh, some are replicas, some are the real deal from that era. In the closet, we keep our 20s flapper girl. And the reason she's in there is she's absolutely scandalous. Uh, in the 20s, Many of the fashionable young ladies from Holton would have been dressed precisely like this. Uh, loose dress, very, very scandalous. Uh, up until then, everything was gathered at the waist. And those legs, she's showing almost her entire leg below the knees. So we keep her kind of off to the side just as a reminder that the 20s were a prosperous, exciting period in the town of Holton, but for parents who had a young daughter who was dressed like this and going out on the town, it couldn't end well. One of my favorite items is our phone book, which isn't a book at all, but everything from Halbrook to Smyrna up to Harvey Sidon, uh, all on one sheet. So you had it beside your telephone and it was 
really, really easy to look up somebody's number. We call this the children's room. Uh, lots of children's items, strollers, dolls. A very interesting doll that we have was reportedly made by George S. Gentle. George S. Gentle was a prominent uh, Houghton insurance man, and he had two children. Unfortunately, his son died at age 18, and his daughter Edna lived with him and cared for him in his older years, and he always had a great love of uh, children and wanted to see a place for them in this town. And in Edna Gentle's will, she left the funds for such a facility, which we now call the Rec Center, or more appropriately, the General Memorial Building. Also in this room, we have a piece of the Tiffany glass that was part of the furniture that was in the French's drugstore. Uh, French's was an extremely busy drugstore, they referred to themselves as, and they also made some medicines there that they had patented and uh, those medicines did very well so the French family uh, had nothing but the best in their drugstore mahogany cabinetry uh, highlighted with Tiffany glass it didn't get any better than that wherever you went. Shoe lasts were critical to the New England shoe industry whether they were made in factories or in many, many cases made in homes, it was necessary for each maker to have a very large selection of wooden blocks that were shaped like a human foot. And they were made usually out of rock maple in really large numbers in Harvey Siding. And these shoe lasts uh, were a big, big industry for this area, uh, employed a lot of men making these shoe lasts. This little darling right here is, of all things, a dog tower cutter tray. It belonged to Gladys Rogan uh, down to Five River Street. Gladys raised border collies and Border Collies love to have a job. They get not in the best of behavior if they don't have a job to do. So Gladys got this ingenious little treadmill hooked up to an up and down churn to make butter with. And I thought maybe that was just a story, but I have an older cousin who assured me that he actually saw the Border Collies up and running on this treadmill and churning butter. Now, larger versions of this were often used when you got back into the woods, when you got away from water power. They were used for up and down saws and they were also used for grist mills when they would turn the wheels that would grind the grains into flour. Quite an ingenious little contraption. Here we have some Procter & Gamble soap and the latest in washing machine technology from 1892. This little contraption wasn't popular for very long because by 1892 we had homes starting to be wired with electricity. And when electricity came in and that agitator could be powered by electricity, this hand model quickly went out of favor. This is another wood stove from the Houghton Foundry. It was extremely expensive to bring items into the Houghton area from outside, so whatever you could make here, you did. This little contraption would have been in most homes. One of the early sources of income, and actually the early sources of scrap, was cedar shingles. Uh, shingles were used on every building to make them 
watertight and on every roof. One reason that you have the great fires that you have because of these tinder dry shingles. So what you would do during the winter time in particular when there was little else uh, for people in the home to do, most of the men would have been in the woods camps, they would pound away on blocks of cedar and make shingles which they could either use on their own building or they were, were just as good as money with with inside. Great. Native made snowshoe. You can tell the difference on the native made shoes. Uh, the weaving is all very, very fine in a native made shoe and thus it would support you better on the snow. When these began to be made uh, by factories it wasn't economical to do as fine a weave and they got away from that. And oftentimes uh, you'll see just cowhide strips sewn in through it and that is almost always uh, a shoe that is not native. These are the real McCoy right here. This light beside it would have been almost universal. This is how you would have gone out to the barn or gone most anywhere in the house. Uh, you would have had a, a candle in here. Perhaps a little later you would have had a little whale oil lamp. And the idea was that you had just a lot of very small holes to emit the light but to make sure the fire stayed inside because the last thing you wanted to do was start a fire in your barn. We have a high wheeler bicycle. We've all seen these on American Pickers with the, the big front wheel and the very small back wheel. Um, bicycles were really, really popular in Houghton in the 1890s, early 1900s, uh, before autos came into widespread use. The design very quickly changed to two smaller wheels uh, that were equal in size for the very simple reason that you could kill yourself on one of these things taking a header off that. I don't think it's anything I'd want to try to ride on. Over on the table we have a special camping kit that was put together for the tourists and campers. Uh, this was put together right here in Holton and after the B&A Railroad came through the sportsmen and the tourists became an extremely important part of the economy of Aroostook County. On the back wall we have a large image of a potato harvest scene. Like many of these scenes the potatoes are all laid out there with no tops on them. If you look to the left of the barrels you'll see where they got rid of all of those tops. In the earliest days, uh, men with potato forks would dig the potatoes from the ground. And if you've ever done that, you know just how hard that work is. So when we had the small gasoline motor, which would turn the digger bed, lay those potatoes out on the ground, even if it was just one roll at a time with two horses, that was just a huge advance and it, it made popular, uh, possible much larger potato harvest. This is a, a great scene. It would have been uh, projected onto this very large board. There are others, for example, at the Holton Post Office which were projected on and then were all hand colored, which was, was quite an art form. This particular scene we don't know where it is, so if you recognize where this scene is, we would love to hear from you. And my guess is we're probably going to get a number of different answers. Uh, maybe we'll even get the correct one. As John Miller used to say, I'll tell you lots of things and I hope some of them are true. So maybe we can find the truth on this. Where is it located?